Hello to the chicos and the chicas. We are back with Inside My Head. Um, and today on the menu is a game that I'm not displaying, so allow me to put the names up. Against uh, Abinav. And I, I tried the modern. I, I quite like occasionally throwing in the modern. I think that this is something that uh, Kings Indian players um, in general should try to experiment with because obviously there is a a little bit of a connection between King's Indian and uh, Peart's or modern structures with the Fia and Ketot Bishop. So why not Coconut? Um, this also gives a bit of an extra spin uh, to the Inside Might Head series in the sense that um, it's not always the same openings that I tend to play all the time. So hopefully there is a little bit of a variety here. So for the time being I'm just developing normal uh, although in the modern black sometimes delays the development of this knight in order to begin a queenside operation uh, rather quickly. So knights is three castles and here the idea is, and this is by the way a very topical and typical motif in a lot of openings, is that we have got this knight takes e4 idea destroying the opponent's center and if knight takes then pawn d5 fork. And now we are going to go for this because uh, that's what we do. This is the most uh, principled move. And after d5 we expect bishop d3 takes and bishop takes. And here the general idea is that um, white now enjoys a very nice uh, piece layout and uh, some kind of a spatial advantage in the center. So when you have a scenario like this, your number one objective is to somehow contest this center. Now obviously my only two ways to contest this center is e5 or c5. Neither is possible right now. Although potentially c5, d takes c5, queen a5 is already something that I could should consider. Or alternatively I could go knight d7 first, preparing for the c5 break right away. Now I don't think there is much wrong with the instant c5 takes queen a5 idea because if bishop e3 i could take on b2 but out there i feel like after rook b1 white's uh, development uh, advantage is getting out of uh, control so let's go knight d7 and the idea is to play c5 next against virtually everything potentially bishop e3 is something that i would uh, consider to respond to in a different fashion in which case I would have knight f6 with a tempo on this bishop and when the bishop drops back I would have knight g4 or knight d5 both of these moves so c4 was played and now there is no time to waste so now I have both options open I don't really like e5 because after a potential trick it would lead to a symmetrical pawn structure and as best as I can help it I tend to avoid those um, and so we are going to go for c5. Now takes knight takes c5 is very pleasant for black because then the long diagonal is mine. So bishop e3 was the anticipated move. Now again, we have got multiple choices here, but I can already see the problem with this move. And that is that now knight f6, knight g4 is going to come very quickly, tickling the bishop on e3. This is another thing that I tell my students all the time. Bishop on e3, is a magnet to a knight to come to g4. And a lot of the openings that have uh, these openings, white often has to play h3 or occasionally f3 in the Sicilian, for example, to be sure that that bishop doesn't get hassled um, on uh, e3. A textbook example for this, and I will show you this in a separate board whilst, uh, yeah, I know that it's the game is on, baby. It's all good. So if you think about it, in the dragon, for example, where white exclusively plays uh, bishop e3. Now knight g4 is a losing mistake because of bishop b5, but after bishop g7, white has to play f3 to secure, so to speak, this bishop against the knight g4 hasslement. And so in this game, now I'm going to kick this bishop. It has to go. We anticipate bishop c2, and then we play knight g4, kicking this bishop, which now, if I calculate it correctly, cannot move at all without losing the pawn on d4. And if that is the case, that means that I'm going to get the dark squared bishop for this knight, and that's all I need. I do not need to, this is a very rare case 
when I would argue that I didn't need to calculate because once I have the dark squared bishop without its counterpart on the white side, my position by default has to be at least okay, hopefully more. Now, the only downside of this trade was, was that now I have secured a very f sturdy center for the time being, and I also can't kick the knight on a, uh, f3. So now I'm thinking about how to put more pressure on d4. And the first and most obvious move that comes to mind is uh, queen b6. And that is, I believe, the move I'm going to play. Although, after rook b1, I'm still not quite sure how I would continue. Somehow the development of this bishop has become a little bit awkward. Bishop h6 is a possibility, but I feel like I'm just helping them to play... Mm. Yeah, maybe just queen e2, actually. I'm helping them play moves that they want to do. So let's try to just see what happens if we, we yeah, put a bit of pressure on d4, a bit of pressure on b2. Pressure is good. Pressure is good. So yeah, if rook b1, then I can consider rook d8. Although, to be perfectly honest with you, Given that this file is open here onto my f7 pawn, I would feel a lot more secure by bringing this rook to um, d8. But obviously that cannot be done without the development of the c8 bishop. So now we are getting into a loop where I'm repeating the same thing that I have been saying. Um, I was reluctant to, um, to consider after rook b1 the idea of bishop e6. Oh, that looks horrid. This looks absolutely terrible because it breaks the pawns apart. It opens up the bishop's diagonal. Yeah, so this is a typical case and I don't know if uh, you who is watching it, what rating range you are sitting at, but for many, this would come into consideration. But if you show this to a higher rated player, they would be like, just no, you can't do that. And they feel like they don't even need to explain. I am now, which is like, we have got three super easy targets now. And I don't know where this, where I was going with this, but what I wanted to tell you was that after rook b1, I didn't want to play bishop e6 because of d5. And I was thinking that perhaps after rook b1, I should take, take, and then bishop e6. Or even e5, trying to revitalize the attack against the pawns in the center. I, I Actually, I may have... Yeah, I don't know. I think I think that it didn't matter. I was thinking that maybe I would have been better off taking this first. But actually, no, queen c5 is better because now three pawns are hanging. So this this should be all over Red Rover. Uh, in terms of uh, the objective evaluation of the position. Which, by the way, is a very old hobby horse of mine that uh, at no point should you not have a very clear idea about how you are going in your game, right? You could be totally wrong about that. The lower level you go, the more often you find that people have a very firm belief about at certain times about how good or bad their position is, and that firm belief is entirely wrong. But that's still a lot better than just carrying on in a game without having any kind of direction as far as how are we going? Right? That, that, that's not okay. We always need to know where we are. And right now, my feeling here is, is that unless I really do something stupid, we should win this. Queen e2, and frankly, I see no reason why I shouldn't take this. I could throw bishop e6 in, but then the bishop moves may defend this and open up the defense towards here as well. Yeah, I, I will take it. I did look at bishop g6, but I just take the rook and... Um, that's a full rook, actually, because after rook takes, I get to take the bishop on top of that. Now I'm going to come back to f6. And note that I'm not going to g7, but to f6. And the purpose of this move is dual, at least dual purpose. Number one, I am cancelling out both knight squares. And number two, I am blocking off the f-file. 
So now there are no funky shenanigans whatsoever that could happen on the F file. And now you can see that he has immediately abandoned that plan. And now I'm just looking at these very tender pawns and I'm like, all right, I'm going to now attack you by just naturally developing my pieces. Queen g3 is a move that might come into consideration later um, because bishop h3 is obviously threatening there. But I might leave it for uh, the time when this queen may or may not uh, leave the king side when actually bishop takes immediately becomes a deadly move. Okay. Um, I just go rook d8. This looks very, very healthy. Bring a new piece to the uh, to the game. The d file is open. Um, we may already be threatening with rook d3. I was too lazy to calculate this because generally I don't like to spend too much time on a move that is apparently really good. Moves that do not need justification. In this position, when all of my pieces are playing barring the rooks, bringing the rook into the game should not really require any kind of deep thought or major theory behind it and likewise by the way if you are thinking about any other move here you're probably wasting your time because that's the thematic thing to do bring the rock now this is hanging and rook d3 queen takes bishop c4 queen c2 pins my bishop to the queen so i'm just going to play b6 which by the way i was considering here as a measure of fixing the weakness on c4 but then my better judgment took over and I went like, nah, bring the rooks, dude. You, you can worry about those dudes later. There's no way that I can play a better move than rook d8 here. And now this rook b1 turned out to be a bit of a time wasting in my opinion. And um, yeah, okay. So now the queen is sliding further and further away from said king side. So now, for example, if I went queen g3, queen f2 wouldn't be playable because uh, this is hanging. And now I'm going to show you how the mind of the international master works. So queen g3 is attractive, but then I look at why not bishop h3? And if takes, then check. And that hits this and this. And if the queen blocks, I shall take said queen, they take back and rook takes d3. I find this very convincing. And since I always enjoy playing a little bit of flashy stuff, uh, let's go. Bishop takes. So once again, if they take, there is a check that hits the king and the unguarded knight. And if the queen blocks the check, I pick off the bishop. C5 is, I reckon, their best choice here to try to sort of counter stir the pot. But I've got multiple very good moves against that idea. Queen g3 is one of them, threatening rook takes d3. <laughs> yeah, there is a video about predicting, by the way, on my channel. And the other good choice here is simply surrendering the bishop, hitting the rock that cannot retain the fifth rank. And upon abandoning it, I can just pick off this pawn for free. Wow, someone is following my stream whilst I'm not even streaming. That's interesting. Uh... Yeah, let's just go back. We have done our job, what we needed to do here. The computer may disapprove of this move, but now I need to think practically, right? So my time has gone down to 122 vastly because I kept on explaining things. Otherwise, I would have played these moves a lot faster. But now is the time to get real and practical. So now, as soon as the rook abandons this uh, fourth, uh, fifth rank, I'm going to take on c5, initiating trades and uh, working towards an end game where my uh, 75 extra pawns are going to be the decisive factor. And because of the queens are hopefully coming off the board, there are far fewer chances for my opponent to create tactical threats. And two, the converting part of the game becomes far simpler, simply because fewer pieces, fewer problems. This is a very stupidly sounding idea, but that's how chess works. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't... Um, explain this but i just wanted to keep up the momentum of the game in terms of speed perhaps bishop b5 bishop a8 
Oh, actually, sorry. Yeah, I rushed this. So bishop takes, bishop takes, bishop d3 was just winning on the spot. That was just ridiculously dumb by me that uh, I didn't calculate that. But that's fine. c6 um, is not threatening with anything. I can just take this. Um, and if they pin me, I can still take the rook here. Because they are also just winning a rook on the 7th rank. I've got various moves after rook c1, actually, that um, I can work with. Uh, let me just check very quick if I've got something better. Yeah, nah, I'm happy. Take, take, take. And again, let's trade. He's going to go check, forcing my king closer to the center. Good news. And now I can look to penetrate and start uh, hassling the pawn on a2. I don't really know what to expect. King f2 or rook a8. That I didn't anticipate. He wants to regroup the bishop here from where it guards this. So that makes some sense. I'm going to blunt in the diagonal already preemptively. Um, a, okay, a4. Let's trade. Trade, trade, trade. This is your mantra in every single endgame where you are clearly winning. Trade. They avoided a trade, try it again. By the way, g5, g4 is a very handy plan here to hassle the knight, but also to tickle the king a little bit. So now I'm just uh, playing very, very logical moves, whilst note how all my pieces are occupying really good squares. Putting your pieces on good squares is half of the story in endgames. If they are occupying active, meaningful posts, then usually they will reward you for that. Of course, it's a far easier concept to demonstrate when uh, you are as winning as I am. He wants a take back. Okay, let's, why not? I want to make it instructive content. I guess he wants bishop c2. Or maybe he just blundered and he wanted a take back. Maybe he wants rook here, yeah, I thought so, but uh, it's only forcing me to do what I wanted to do anyway. So now upon knight move, I have checked and pick of this as well as potentially other uh, tactical... I Ooh. So now if I go... Ah, no, nah, let's keep it simple. Let's go here. Yeah, this is carnage. King here, uh, I take, he goes f4, and then... Okay. So now the knight is trapped, right? So rook h5 is uh, anticipated. Or that. And now we expect resignation. But no, it's not going to come because uh, he's trying to flag us. And again, keep it simple. Now, this is what I want to do. And every single move that I don't do for this is just delaying my win. The reason why I did this check is because it allowed me to trade this. Now, up, up. Up is not so certain because there is a check here. So I'm going to block this off first. And then I'm going to go check. Check here as well. Um, and now we're going to come here. I can't care less about this pawn. That's totally collateral damage. My goal is this. And it's unstoppable now. Uh, we're just going to go here, here, check and mate. Ooh, we missed that. That wasn't pretty. Oh, no, we didn't. Sorry, I'm talking nonsense. So King G2 check. Now I'm like, what? But yeah, of course, um, that was that was all planned. And now he resigned. Bishop check takes and uh, the queen is win. But perhaps King... Yeah, nah, that's just, that's, that's just it. Okay, so let's have a look at what happened in this game. Um, felt fairly straightforward. Um, let me go f full screen here. Um, and let's have a look at what happened. Until here, I felt we played very good chess. Knight d4, d5, take, take, take. And knight 
RC5 is already possible, but knight d7 is the engine's favorite move, and it's dead even. Awesome. c4, c5, awesome. Bishop e3. Knight f6. Wow, did I? Oh, baby! Triple zero agent. Hello? That's good. That is very good. Okay. Knight g4, h3, tac tac. And uh, queen b6 was perfect. And here I told you that this was terrible. And look at the evaluation. We went from minus 0.8 to minus 4. 3.8. Ah, come on. Drop back now. But yeah, you get the point. It's a drastic drop. Huge. Absolutely ginormous drop. Interestingly, by the way, I will need to point this out that he bishop f4 was necessary to jettison this pawn. I vaguely looked at this, but I thought that after takes here and knight h6 fought by knight f5, I was completely winning here. I didn't call it, but this went through my head briefly. And I'm somewhat uh, annoyed by the fact that apparently this is uh, not totally winning for black. In fact, white seems to hold a slight edge still. Interesting. Wait, am I still triple zero? Nah! Ah, oh, bugger. It got ruined in the meantime. All right, so 93 takes on c5. So after b3 or rook b1, I wanted to go... Well, against rook b1, I would have gone take, take bishop e6. Against b3, according to the engine rook d8, that makes perfect sense because now d5 is impossible. Yeah, perfect sense. Okay, and frankly, there was not an awful lot left in this game here. Um, oh, actually, the engine didn't like my bishop h3. What? I wish I understood the engine. Look at this. It doesn't even mention bishop takes h3. It says minus three and a half on 23 depth. And when I play out the move, it goes to seven. Okay, let's push it a little bit. I'm curious. Because this is such a basic tactic, I can't believe that the engine doesn't see it. Surreal. Absolutely surreal. If uh, someone understands how engines work, please send me a comment below about this particular moment in the game when I played I'm, I'm on depth 29 and it's a one move tactic so maybe it's not sound yeah right okay so the NG reckons after whoa yeah so the engine reckons that this is not as much better as uh, the alternative was, which was the queen g3 or the bishop d7 moves. But for a human, it's the cleanest way. Okay, c5, and here I miss queen g3. I saw it. When I say I missed it, I meant that I didn't play it with the idea of takes. I don't know. This felt safer. Bishop b4, and yeah, I should have taken this. That was silly, but here I played fast. Oops. That was me pressing the wrong button. So z. All right, take, 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 and yeah, the rest was just a mop up release. Like I tried to talk some sense into this, but Black's advantage is so tremendous that yeah, it didn't matter what I did anymore here. And it was just an easy mop up in the end. So did it stick with one inaccuracy? Yes. Yeah, so what was my only inaccuracy in the game? Night G4. <laughs> that, that's the move that I was promoting as like, yeah, baby. Go for that knight g4 and turns out that that was my only inaccurate move and it turns out that cd is better. But what if bishop d4? Bishop g4? Is that the idea? Right. That's cool, man. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. So, um, yeah. That was our um, inside my head. I don't know if I'm going to add another game to this or not, but now I have a video editing program that I can fiddle with. So we'll see whether it uh, makes it to YouTube by itself or maybe I add another game to it. All in all, it was a good fun and uh, a semi-decent introduction into the Peerts slash Modern with Black. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I shall be back with more soon. Thanks for watching.